Hello, this is the session, how to be a compiler. My name is Mariko, that's my Twitter handle and my GitHub handle, pretty much everywhere on the internet except MySpace. Um, if you want to try, you can find it. It was taken when I uh, registered it in 2000, you know, five or six. Uh, I'm fluent from New York City. I'm based in New York City. Uh, I work at a Google's web developer relations team. Uh, my job is to make you help you make better web. So if you have any concerns, complaints, things that you want to say to people at, uh, who's making a web standards or web browser, please do use me as a proxy to send those messages and please do come talk to me. Uh, and speaking of web, I am primarily a JavaScript developer. And when I'm not using JavaScript at work, I also like to knit. That's my hobby. Um, and when I learned to code, this hobby and work kind of like married together, and I started doing everything with knitting and JavaScript. So one of the example uh, projects that I do is thing called Sweaterify. So should you like to have a visualization of ugly sweater that's using a uh, strange loop loop, then you can go in, upload the image, and then create a a uh, very realistic visualization. This doesn't really translate on the screen, but if you go in the screen, then I'm very proud of how realistic it is to look. And I spent a lot of hours looking at SVG and Canvas to have this like right type of um, a shadow and right type of face for this knit. So like, if you want to use it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I started code while I already knew how to knit. And it became a thing that in order to learn to code, I make something for my other hobby, which is knit. So the first thing I did was making low counter. Uh, my version of doing to do MVC was making low counter. Uh, you know, state management, browser events, you know, saving local data. Great. Another one I did was color helper. So if you do knit, and decided to do color work, like a fair isle. Um, there's a common technique amongst knitter to take a black and white picture of yarn that you're going to use. Because when you're making color work, you have to make sure that the colors, two colors that you are using next to each other, has a distinct contrast so that the pattern comes out and doesn't really blend it into like mesh of black or dark green, right? So they do this technique of using a ca phone camera and then put the black and white filters to define that like, okay, it's contrasted enough. But if you done, uh, if you've done work with color space, you know that's not true. Like the red and green might come out as the same black and white value while it's actually contrast color having a, um, look at the color, uh, uh, in color, right? So, you know, that was fun project, uh, learning about color space and vector math. And then next I went into image processing because I had this like um, one time where I was obsessed with printing out picture in knitwear. So should you have wished to have your cat on your uh, sweater, then you have to do this interesting thing. First of all, you have to have a very low resolution image because in the sweater, you probably have like 80 pixel to 160 pixel as a width, uh, depending on what kind of yarn you use. And also yarn doesn't come in hex code. So, you know, at most, <laughs> at most you can use like six colors at a time. So you have interesting challenge of resizing the image, reducing the noise. Uh, how do we do that by preserving the shape? Uh, how do we reduce the color, posterization, dithering, a uh, whole bunch of interesting things that I did. Um, and I made a image processing library for that. That was interesting. And then I went into compiler and DSL. And you were like, that was kind of jump. What the fuck is that? Um, <laughs> I promise it will make sense in a minute. I'm going to go into it. So this talk is about alternative the introduction to building compiler. And I want to emphasize that it is an alternate introduction. So it is going to be introductory, but also it's alternate. So I am not going to talk about recursion or uh, visitor pattern. I'm not going to talk about the tools like Yak, Lex, and LLVM. Um, it's going to be an explanation of compiler from the point of view of a knitting person who tried to make compiler for knitting. So uh, 
a visualization of my target audience is that if you feel like a word compiler is like a black box where your code gets sent to, and if they are bad, they're trapped forever and cannot come back. <laughs> um, that was my understanding of compiler before going in. Again, I'm a JavaScript developer. Like, I literally deal with compilers. And I started dealing with compiler with like Babel and things, and I was just like very intimidated. But after this talk, I hope to like change the perception by thinking like, you know, compilers are a box of fun. <laughs> uh, so now that the, the expectations are set, let's dive into it. So before talking about compilers, I need to explain you what knitting is so that we are all on the same page. So when you want to make these beautiful sweaters, you go in, you download or buy a pattern. In this case, I'm showing the free pattern that you can actually go download. The knitting comes in two formats, either a glass or knitting chart, uh, a pattern. So glass is called knitting chart, and this is what I grew up. Uh, I grew up in Japan. A Japanese knitting publication is uh, primarily used chart. So I learned to lead these chart. I learned to lead each symbols, and I can just dive in, look at the chart, and then start knitting. However, I moved to the United States six years ago, and here we use a pattern, the written pattern, uh, which is like this. And this is essentially a step-by-step -step word explanation of that chart that you just saw. So it's two things the same, but represented in two different things. And I swear, every year, some programmer go home during a holiday season, sit next to somebody who is knitting, looking at the pattern, and tweet that, oh, hey, knitting is like code. And every time that happens, I get CC'd on the thread, and I'm like, <laughs> listen. <laughs> Listen, I know, welcome to the club. <laughs> so let's dive into what it looks like. So if you do knit, then I hope you have a similar feeling that knitting is code. But if you don't, then you will get it, uh, hopefully. So even without knowing anything about knitting, if you are given this piece of text, I think you would think that this is a code. You can see repeating word like K, maybe kind of like a valuable, and then more distinct one like until remaining or repeat from, which kind of indicates loop. So the knitting is, atomic unit for knitting is knit and purl. So when you knit, that means you are pulling the yarn from the back of the loop, creating this kind of like heart shape chain together face of a fabric. And then pearl is pushing the uh, yarn from the back, creating this like bumpy look. And combination of those two creates a beautiful pattern usually. Um, there is like knit two together or make one, like, like a combination, but like atomic unit is just knit or pearl. So if you go look into your sweater, uh, so the left one is a two by two ribbing, which is very common in your cuff for the, the uh, sweater or the neckline. It's basically knit, knit, pearl, pearl, knit, knit, pearl, pearl, knit, knit, pearl, pearl, repeating all the way up. And then the next one uh, that looks a little more intricate, if you look at it, it is just a knit, pearl, knit, pearl, 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 kind of like shifting one low by low, creating this more intricate patterns. So. That's the basic knitting. Uh, so let's look, dive into look at this knit. And I'm a JavaScript developer, so I'm going to show you a, a JavaScript code. And you will understand why I write JavaScript, because it's so good for knitting. Uh, I will explain that <laughs> later. But when you think about knitting as a code and try to write a computer code that the browser understands, it is essentially a LA manipulation. So let's go see one by one, row by row. So first one is CO5, which is abbreviation for cast on five, which means put the, so let's say this is the uh, knitting needle, put five loops on the needle. So basically create a, a my scarf, the parent array, but then create uh, an inner array, row zero, which is five, length of five, and then you push that into the scarf. So this is basically, you know, you have five stitches on your needle to start. Next one is row one, knit. And when the pattern says just knit, 
That means knit whatever, how many ever that you have on the needle, just make that knit stitch for it. So the low one is a map of row zero to create this KSTS. Uh, STS is uh, stitches and knitting speak, I guess, uh, common abbreviations. So now I can create a low one that has a string K, uh, five of them, because the low zero was five. The next one is a little, whoops, oh, so this is how it looks like in the real life. The next one is a little more complicated and you can't really solve it with map because uh, there's so many things going on. So let's do one by one. Um, law two, uh, in knitting, you can't create uh, a magic numbers, well, magic uh, stitches immediately. It, it, you always inherit the size of the previous array. So you create a new array because it's on the needle, right? Like you can't like f go from 10 stitches to 100 stitches immediately. There will be instruction if that's needed. So there's no instruction to create a new stitches. So we'll just inherit the sides from the previous array and create a low two array. And then keep the index. And then the first one is two, K2, which means knit two. So just you know push the letter K to the first two elements of this array. The next one, M1, is make one. So the M is stands for make, which basically means here, please create one stitch that didn't exist, but please create it. And there's many ways to create it, but uh, usually you uh, pick the stitch from the down. Um, but you know, in the array, it's kind of like a splice and changing the length. And you start to see that JavaScript, the best language to do this, because you are manipulating the size of array and checking the size of array. Um, as you go around. Uh, I learned C++, I went to like C++ class six months ago, and I learned a new syntax, and I was like, I'm a programmer, I know the syntax, I'm gonna port this knitting uh, program into C++. And the first very innocent question that I came up was like, to instructor was, how do I know a length of an array in C? <laughs> and how do I change that size of an array? And the instructor was like, yeah, about that. <laughs> um, I now know how memory allocation works. In JavaScript, it's not. Uh, so the next one, now that we change the size of an array, next one is knit until two stitches remaining, which means uh, until the two empty elements left in the array, just put knit stitch into that array. So uh, in this case, it's only adding one knit stitch, but uh, length still remains in six, and there is two empty uh, element in this array. And comes M1 again, so now we're changing the size of array again. Now the size of array is seven. And then the last one is knit two, filling in those things. So at the end of this procedure, my scarf array has this three rows of starting with nothing of five to knit five to knit seven. And lastly, uh, so it started with these tiny operations, and then lastly, you repeat it for 20 times, and then you start to get shape of scarf. Um, you might guess that this operation, if you continue to do it 400 times or 200 times, you would get triangular scarf. However, when you deal with knitting, uh, you can see a little bit on this picture that it's carved, like making the carve. Um, you get to deal with fun mass called hyperbolic geometry. Uh, knitting is not a Euclidean space, but hyperbolic space. So if you do know, uh, I still don't have the answer for it, but I do want to make this like knitting visualizer that like uh, translate the knitting pattern into actual representation of visualized uh, thing. And if you know how to deal with hyperbolic geometry on the 2D canvas, please do let me know because my math understanding is not quite there yet. So, what, why does this lead to compiler and DSL, the domain-specific language? So, I was, when I started learning code, I immediately went into understanding knitting with code. Um, three summers ago, I took a, a little challenge of going to a little uncomfortable area of trying to explore this as an artistic 
uh, a thing that I do. And I enrolled this program called School for Poetic Computation. Uh, it is a artist land school in New York City where uh, programmers and artists get to go for a certain amount of time. I went for a short uh, period of time, but uh, there is a 10 week program. And basically, it's a place you get to do fun shit with code and art. Um, in there, I took a class by Sarah, who spoke yesterday here, called Talking to Machines, Those Assholes. Um, and it was basically a class to explore programming language that talks to computer as an artistic medium. So we learned a lot about domain-specific language and how to make those things, and parser, ideal parsers, and, you know, looking the tooling machine, and, like, you know, a lot of things. Uh, so. My project for this class was that, oh, I've been thinking about knitting with code, you know, looking from like how to see knitting from the computer's point of view, but what if I can make a knitting point of view exposed into a computer? So I made a small programming language called 64 Stitches. And idea was to uh, treat a knitting pattern that we just deciphered with uh, JavaScript as a computer code. So you might see in the thing the C of eight, like quick cast on eight, uh, until the main stitches. Uh, you can kind of change, and I made an interactive REPL to change the pattern as you change those values in the code. Um, my graphical programming skill was not quite there yet back then, so I decided to do a underscore and star as a replacement for knit and pearl stitch to do, uh, represent the color difference, uh, not the uh, fabric difference. The visualization for the sweater pattern came a year later. So now I can make this like a almost realistic representation of knitting fabric, but back then I used just, you know, color. So the underscore represents white pixel, the uh, asterisk represents a black pixel. So I tweeted, good thing about this is that the entire code fits in the URL. So a lot of people started to tweeting me their code in the URL form, and I made a little bit of like a visualizer. So here is the invader that they made, and skull, and cat. So a lot of people got the idea that the cast on is defines the width of this pattern, but not many people got into this like loop action of the programming language that I defined. A lot of them ended up just defining one by one pixel of the color, which is fine, uh, kind of interesting. So I use PEG.js to make this project. PEG.js is a parser generator for JavaScript, which lets you like basically generate a parser or the compiler using a thing called parsing expression glamour. And entire code for doing this, uh, the 64 stitches, looks like this, with a little bit of JavaScript outside of this page. Um, so it was, you know, it was like a little bit of time to learn how to do this expression. But it's kind of amazing that these tiny bit of code can spit out a, a parser that supports a very small programming language. That was interesting. However, I'm pretty much in the school of thinking that abstraction is a tool, not magic, and you have to learn it to use it. So even though I had this interesting experience of amazing experience of being able to create a domain-specific language for knitting, I was very frustrated that I did not understand what goes into it. I felt like somebody told me, yeah, just that works as is and just accept it as is. And I know there's many people who teach programming tell uh, beginners that, like, you know, just, you know, abstraction is amazing, just, you know, don't question it and use it and just, we'll get there later. I'm the kind of person who have to understand what those abstraction is step by step in order to utilize those abstraction. Like once I understand how jQuery works, I'm like just use jQuery everywhere. But until I understand it, then I have to write uh, a DOM code by my hand, by myself. So that's just my type of person. So I got, it got me into like kind of bagging idea of, ah, uh, I want to make compilers. I want to make this like, you know, understand how to make programming language at work also. Uh, back then I worked at a company called Scripto, which made a text editor for TV production. So TV producers and writers use specific glamour to write, specify the characters and scenes. And, you know, I could have just been doing like making a React component and, you know, doing the UI part, but 
because I was maybe interested, I volunteered to do a converter of converting those specific gamma into, back then I didn't know what ASD is, so I was just calling like a structured JSON data, and then so that you can convert it into rich text or some other format. So here is the a year ago almost of my uh, comment to work Slack that my comment code has function named Lexer and Parser. And I kept thinking, this sounds like computer science. Maybe I'm a programming computer. So you can see that a year ago, my understanding was that. I was starting to double with a lot of blog posts and idea, uh, exposed to the idea of computer science uh, compilers, but I wasn't quite there yet. But I listened to a podcast interview by uh, a, a Japanese guy who interviewed Louis Rayama, who um, co it's called Rebuild FM. But uh, in there, they were talking about this project that Louis did, which is how I wrote a self-hosting C compiler in 40 days. And the interview goes with like, so it's kind of amazing that you made a C compiler. Like, how the hell did you start it? And he goes in with like, well, if you think about it, the language specification for C is very set and very minimal compared to other uh, language. And you know, you just start with day one creating a string, a string um, uh, expressions and another uh, little, literals, and next day you add another operators, and you know, you, one, one by one, you add features to the C language, and you know, after 40 days, you get a self-compiling uh, C code. And I was like, okay, that is really interesting approach. Uh, maybe I might be looking at this project wrong of thinking that I have to understand this compiler thing in order to make a programming language or the parser. Maybe this feeling, I should start with tiny corner and just like start doing it. Coincidentally, I discovered a book called Design by Numbers, which is written by John Maeda. Design by Numbers is a name of the book, but also name of a programming language developed at MIT Media Lab uh, back in 80s, 90s. Uh, it is a precursor to processing, and it is designed to teach philosophy and nuts and bolts of how programming works to artists. So the code for DBN, Design by Number, looks like this, like paper zero, pen, 100, line zero, zero, 100, 100, and then the output of that code, the compiled results of that code is the image next to it. The book is beautiful. Book goes through uh, one by one um, the first idea of what is color, what is pen, what is like to put a dot on the uh, screen, to what it's like to store data in a valuable, to what it's like to have a loop so that you can create 100 different versions of this image. And if you go cover to cover, you kind of understand the evolution of creating a programming language, much like the guy who created the C compiler, a self-compiling C. Uh, you know, it starts with very tiny thing into very aerobolic big thing. So, I was like, this is interesting. I went into websites to see if there's any more resources. Great thing, the new version of DBN came out in 2003 that supports a browser that you can learn interactive code. So I went in, click, and then, you know, of course, it's Java based, so it doesn't work. Um, I wasn't too keen on compiling Java source code myself. So I was like, I know a programming language or the, the language that does this that works in modern browser, which is SVG. Could I, maybe this is a good chance, that I start making my own compiler that takes a syntax that is well-defined in the book, designed by numbers, into a SVG. After all, compiler is like taking a source code, doing something, and outputting it. While I was leading the book, I was taking a written code, thinking myself what it would look like, and then imagining the picture that would come out. So basically, I was being compiler. So how can I make that into code? So let's do a little experiment of being a compiler. So the precursor information that in DBN, the space is always 100 by 100, the corner, 
the bo bottom left corner is 0, 0, and then bottom, uh, top right corner is 100, 100. Color is defined from 0 to 100. 0 is white. Uh, black is 100. There is no other color. Let's see this code and think about what kind of graphic this code will produce. And this is the exact exercise that I did of like thinking about, you know, I just did this by reading this book. What just happened? Let's just do it again. And you have a guess? Yes, yes, okay. Uh, if you guess this one, then congratulations, you just became a compiler. Uh, let's look at what, go, what went into your brain by doing so. So, you were given this piece of code, the string, that you, don't, you somehow understand the rule of the programming language, like colors and space. First thing you did, probably, is to define that, okay, uh, distinguish between the word and number. So, you divide those things, and then you classify those as a word or number. After that, given the programming rule that I told you about the paper has a size and the color, um, you probably started to group those together, thinking that, okay, after paper, there is a color number, so those are two, uh, one chunk. After pen, there is always color, so there's another chunk. And then after line instruction, maybe there is XY coordinate for two points to draw. So those are one chunk. So you started to group those things together. And after that, you probably change that in your head into human readable language, like get white paper or white rectangle and grab a black pen and draw a line in the middle, 50-50 of the uh, Y coordinate from left side X0 to right side X100. And compile the result. It's this. So you just compiled it, you draw it. This is kind of like executable that you get after compiling C code. You can give it to anybody and everybody would say, yes, there is a straight line in the middle. They don't care about what kind of code that produced this thing, but you can share those things and they will, everybody will get the same result. So those are the compiled results. And you, we just did a steps that compiler takes. Uh, we just did a chunking into tokens, creating a structure, changing the shape of that structure, and outputting a code. So let's look at it in computer speak uh, in order to make this com uh, compiler that I was trying to make, which is taking DBN syntax and then outputting a SVG. So the first thing that happened is tokenization. And this is the only section of the, the talk that happens, like computer, the uh, keyword. Um, so sometimes it's called lexical analyzer. You get a string, paper 100, and then you output things that's like a little more uh, divided and classified. So in this case, I basically split with, uh, uh, do the split operation with uh, space, and then check if it's not a number or not, and then classify it as a word or paper. So that's what we were doing on the side, shows what we just looked at. And after you have those things, you do thing called parsing. And when you do parsing, you create a thing called abstract syntax tree, or AST for short. AST uh, is like map of your code. So let's say uh, by de defining things, you now have a point on the map that says, here's a city office, here's a station, here's a, uh, your house, and you know, here's something else. And by creating AST, you map the, the relations of those points and how those points connect together by load. So you kind of start to draw the map of your code. So again, you have those input, and you pass it to parser function, and you would probably create a structured data that looks like this. So in this case, I start with a drawing as a big type, and inside of the drawing, I have a call expression of paper. Paper takes an argument of type number, and in this case, value is 100, or uh, in the, the picture example, it's a zero. Um, and then, once you have that, much like we change it into human readable uh, co uh, a text, you do things called transformation. So transformation is creating a new AST. So in this case, in DVN sphere, 
idea of paper exists, idea of pen exists. However, in order to put those into SVG world, SVG doesn't know what paper is or pen is. Maybe they have a similar understanding that is a path or color or rectangle, but you need to translate those things in order to make SVG. So you give those uh, data and then create a new ASD that's more suitable for the SVG world. So I you know, straight up define tag is SVG, uh, body has the element of rectangle, and that has the attributes. And then finally, so this is what you did with you know, changing into human readable code, uh, or human readable text. And then finally, you do code generation, which is creating actual SVG element. So, you know, again, you take that new ASD, go through that structure, and then just, you know, string concatenate, make SVG uh, code. So, here is a demo that if you are interested, I have a demo online that has a uh, kind of like a lepel, and you can edit it. And you can see step-by-step -step tokenization, what happened, uh, parsing ASD, and transform the ASD, what happened, and then throws you error if uh, something that they don't understand happens. And that's on my GitHub slash SVN. I named it SVN, like SVG by numbers, and live of not uh, designed by numbers. So if you want to look at those and kind of like, you know, on the fingertip understands, um, you can look at that. So. By making compiler is really fun, and I recommend everybody to do it. And here is a huge suggestion that you can do. So, we write, well, I write JavaScript, some of you might write JavaScript, but maybe you can write a compiler that takes a JavaScript code, and, well, that takes a different code and spits out JavaScript. Uh, maybe like Japanese script. So this is something I care a lot. So I, uh, English is my second language, and I damn know that uh, having a privilege of time and money to learn English granted me a lot more opportunity in this industry. Um, you know, it got me able to lead bleeding edge technology documentation, like, you know, without waiting for somebody's translations. It got me able to write a call for proposal for these conference, which get me more visibility in the community. Uh, you know, when we talk about code, and we talk about coding is universal, everybody should learn to code, you have to realize that the language itself you use in code, like function and if and while, is English. Uh, ecos entire ecosystem is English-centric. Um, so maybe seven year old in United States might have easier time, well, like, you know, the, might create a JavaScript code easily to do something awesome. But then in some same year, uh, seven year old in Japan might have, you know, stumbled upon this idea of what is if, what is while, and have to wait to understand those uh, uh, English grammar first to get into computer programming. So those are like something that I really care about. So maybe you can those, do those things. Uh, there is a thing called Fika script, which let you write JavaScript in Swedish, and vice versa. <laughs> so it's possible. It's uh, it's possible if you want to do it for your native language. But not only that, you can do things like emoji code, write a code in emoji. That's awesome. And another one is Piet. So Piet is a programming language that use the code is picture. So the alignment of the color defines what kind of operation these code needs to do. And it's not just an art project, even though it is like weird and fun and like arty. Um, when you deal with, like, say, uh, GPU accelerated uh, uh, kind of like a WebGL, and then, you know, try to do a math on WebGL, um, you do load data in color because, you know, GPU understand image, uh, image is data, data can be stored in the image, and you can, you know, do weird things. So, you know, image as a code is a valid thing. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, I suggest that we should all make compiler. Even though you might not have a project immediately, you should try because you learn a lot of things from build, just building a compiler. And here's the three things I learned after a building a compiler. I'm not saying that like, the computer tells you everything. I don't believe in like, AI as a god. But um, you do understand. Uh, you do get to learn a lot of things and learn from computers sometimes. 
First thing is it's okay to start uh, small and have unfamiliar things. So much like our lexical analyzer started with just you know, dividing up the code and just classifying is it word or number, they didn't need to know what happens in the next step, but they just started with very small thing and you know, let the other step worry about it. So it's really okay to start with small and familiar things, just start it. Another one is be a good parser. Don't be a jerk with Bart Eller message. And it's just not, not just code that you write, but also the human interaction. So I learned computer programming with a lot of people's help. Like I came in, I did basic syntax, but then I learned a lot of things by asking questions. And a lot of helpful um, answers I get is not the answer that I get about the things I asked. It's the thing, the pointer to something else. So let's say I ask X, like I, I don't know why this doesn't work X. The unhelpful error message, or unhelpful message is that, yeah, I think I, it doesn't work. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> that's not helpful, but you don't need, need to solve the problem for me, but you can say something like, well, that's, that wouldn't work. Maybe you should look up these keyword on Google, or you should look at this documentation, like a little bit of pointer to uh, get started. Elm is a language that kind of embraced that methodology, and there is a great blog post about compiler errors for humans. Um, if you write Elm, you know that when Elm throws an error, it says, it's error. But you might want to look at those things. This might be wrong. You might want to look at those things, and it's very helpful. So you should write those error messages in your code, and you should be like those error messages when somebody asks you questions. The lastly, the context is everything. So much like our transformer transformed the uh, information that was suited for DBN world into SVG world, um, you need to switch the context when we're making things. When we're making software, maybe things that you build now for your US market might not work for your Asia market. And you need to find somebody who is really good at transforming those contexts. And those are really good people to have on your team because it makes your uh, production code so much easier to write. They are the one who translates everything that you need to know. So be careful of the context and be awesome compiler. If you're interested in the thing that I talked about, I have a blog post uh, about what I did with uh, JavaScript code sample. So do look at those. It is released in CC by NC SA. So if you want to translate those things to different language, you can totally do that and ping me that you did it and I will link to it. Um, you can use your blog, you can use the uh, GitHub. This is the latest one, the uh, Brazilian Portuguese, uh, the volunteers did. Um, and you know, right now it's like in, translated into five different languages. So if you do speak other language, please do help me. And thank you very much for your kind attention.